Robert Reich has built an extraordinary career working with people across the country to improve the social conditions that form the foundations for healthy lives. Robert Reich served as the former United States Secretary of Labor during the administration of President Bill Clinton. During his time as Labor Secretary, he championed workers' rights by leading a successful effort to raise the minimum wage launching programs to expand job training and taking a stand against sweatshops and other unsafe work sites. Under his direction, the Labor Department administered the Family and Medical Leave Act for the first time and the School to Work Opportunities Act. For his work as Labor Secretary, he was named one of the top 10 best cabinet members in the 20th century by Time Magazine. He also served during the administrations of President Ford and President Carter, in addition to serving on then-President-elect Obama's Economic Transition Advisory Board. All of you have the ability to transform the world just as much as he has. And I have the faith that you will and that we'll do it because of working collectively to do it. That's how Robert Reich has been transformative, working with communities and colleagues across the country and around the world to change working conditions that are so fundamental to our health here in the United States as they were for my neighbors in Tanzania and as they are for our neighbors around the world. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome one amazing change agent to all of our graduates who are themselves extraordinary change agents. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Reich. Well, thank you very much, uh, students and faculty, honored guests, parents, significant others, insignificant others. <laughs> uh, as you can see, uh, the economy has worn me down. <laughs> Taken a lot out of me, but the economy is growing again and there's always hope. Uh, I want to talk a little bit to you about the relationship between public health and the economy and your futures. And maybe the best way to begin that discussion is just to point out something that many of you already know, but I'll state it just in case it is not explicit to everybody here. And that is that since 1980, the United States economy has grown dramatically. In fact, we're almost double the size as an economy we were in 1980. But the median wage has stayed almost stagnant, adjusted for inflation. Now, there are people out there, in fact, I was listening to the radio yesterday, and somebody said, well, average wages are going up. Well, yes, average wages are going up. But there is a fundamental difference between average and median. You all know this. I mean, the basketball player Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six foot one. <laughs> do, do you get my drift? You see, it's possible to pull up the average if, if the people at the top are, are very, very high. And that's why you really want to look at the median that is half above, half below in any society. And the question that I sometimes am asked is what happened to all the money? I mean, if the median wage is stagnant and the economy is almost twice as large as it was in 1980, where did all the money go, class? Class? It went that way. 
Now, there's a danger in, in pointing that out. Let me just hasten to say, because when you say that, or you even point in that direction in terms of where the money went, uh, some people accuse you of being a class warrior. And I want to assure you I'm not a class warrior. I'm a class warrior. <laughs> now, there is a difference. It, it's, a, it's a letter or two between warrior and warrior. And here's what I am worried about. I'm worried about several things. Number one, when you get the kind of inequality we have in the United States, and by the way, I, I, should, I should say the United States degree of inequality, of, of, of all so-called advanced or rich nations, the United States has the most inequality, the most concentration of income at the very top since the recovery began from the recession that started in 2008, the recovery started in 2009, the bottom of the recession, well, 95% of the economic gains have gone to the top 1%. By some measures, it's more than that. And we haven't even talked about wealth. But here's what I'm worried about. Number one, what I worry about as a class worrier is the economy itself. Because you see, if you have so much wealth and so much income going to the very top, your middle class doesn't have enough purchasing power to keep the economy going. And that is indeed one thing that has happened in the United States. We just don't have enough purchasing power. That's why growth has been relatively slow. By the way, when I talk about growth, it's important to make a distinction that, again, most of you probably make, but I want to make sure it is on the table for all of us. That is, I'm not talking about consumerism. I'm not talking about just acquisition of more stuff. When we talk about growth appropriately and understood as it should be understood, we're talking about the capacity of an economy to do more and more. Some of what it can do is better public health, a better environment, better public education, the more capacity it has, the more ability it has to do well by all its people if it wants to. It has a political choice. And that's why so much inequality is a matter of choice. It's not simply economic determinism. Some people say, oh, it's globalization. Well, globalization means inevitably there's going to be inequality because there are winners from globalization who are very well educated and very well connected, and there are losers who are not well educated and not well connected. And the same thing goes for technological change. There are winners and losers depending on education and connections. Well, if that were the case, presumably we'd see the same degree of inequality everywhere else affected by those two powerful forces of globalization and technological change. But we don't. Some nations do a better job either resisting or using those forces in ways that help lift everyone. For some reason, we are not. And it hurts everyone. As John F. Kennedy once said, a rising tide lifts all boats. But the tide here, because there's not enough purchasing power, is not lifting all boats. It's, it's lifting the yachts. <laughs> but the rowboats and the dinghies, many of them are sinking. And so my first worry is the economy overall. We can't sustain an economy like this. My second worry has to do with politics. It has to do with our democracy. As the great jurist and Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once said, we can have a great deal of wealth in a few hands, or we can have a democracy. But we can't have both. Now, he did not sit on the court that decided Citizens United. That was a joke. <laughs> a bad joke, a very bad joke. Louis Brandeis actually came from a different era. He came from the progressive era. 
an era in the United States when a lot of people woke up to the fact that the gilded age of the late 19th century was generating vast inequalities that were not only bad for the economy, but also very bad for democracy. Because when that much wealth and income go to the top, that's also where political power tends to go. And it tends to feed on itself, because the more political power that goes to the top, when the wealth and the income are there, the more power there is at the top to shape the rules of the game to generate more income and wealth at the top. You see how that pattern can become a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy, a vicious cycle that feeds on itself. And that's the problem. There is so much money in American politics that is coming not from average working people, but from people who have a very specific, particular vested interest in the rules favoring them at the top. And what does this lead to? It leads to cynicism. Cynicism. If you're cynical about politics, if you don't want to enter the political fray, you are cynical ultimately about democracy. And if you give up on democracy, you give up on everything. You allow the muddied interests to win everything. And so my second worry is about the sustainability of our democracy when we have this degree of inequality. And my third worry, related to the first two, has to do with public health. The health of our polity, our public, broadly conceived, broadly understood. I was in a debate yesterday with somebody who said, you know, you've got to stop worrying so much about inequality in general. You've got to stop talking about inequality. The real problem is poverty. Why don't we just all get together and, 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 really, and really cure the problem and remedy the problem of poverty, and then we can, we can get on with what we need to do. Why don't talk about inequality. Well, the argument I made back to him is the following. That if your middle class is under great stress, regardless of whether you're talking about the American middle class or middle class anywhere, if it's under great stress, if it's actually sh shrinking, it's harder to get people out of poverty for the simple and logical reason that there are fewer places to move into because there are fewer people and slots in the middle class to aspire to. And also, if the middle class is shrinking and under greater and greater stress, then the middle class is naturally going to be less generous to people at the bottom. They are more likely to fall for the false idea that it's the people at the bottom who are taking away their money. It's the people at the bottom that are demanding more and more of their resources. It's the people at the bottom that are responsible for the fact that they're not getting anywhere. In other words, when the middle class is shrinking, you have set up yourself for the politics of resentment, exploiting racism, exploiting other divides for political gain in ways that not only hurt the poor, but reduce the possibility of everyone winning. The other point with regard to public health, and you again have probably seen the same data I've seen, showing that there is a direct correlation between some indices of public ill health and inequality. Life expectancy, mental illness, infant mortality, teenage births, homicides, drug and alcohol abuse and addiction, all these are correlated with a nation's degree of inequality. The more inequality, the more you have of these things. Now, again, correlation is not causation, I have to remind you. But the correlation is powerful. And it runs not only with regard to nations, it also runs even in the United States. You look at a particular state, and you see higher levels of all of these indicia of social harms 
when you have states that have higher levels of inequality. The correlation actually is to inequality more than it is to even the average, there I go again, average level of wealth or income in those states. So why is that? Why is inequality correlated with all of these social problems? What could you possibly imagine is the connection? Well here, if you'll permit me a personal word. I am obviously pretty short now. When I was growing up, I was even shorter. <laughs> In fact, as a young kid, I was very, very short. And as a four-year-old or five-year-old or six-year-old who was very, very short, I, I was, well, I was bullied. I mean, a lot of kids are bullied. I was bullied. And occasionally I was beaten up. And finally, at the age of about six, or maybe it was seven, I decided I'd had enough. And I tried to fight back, and guess what? It didn't work. <laughs> I just got beat up even more. So I came up with another idea. I decided to make alliances with older boys, just a couple of them. I just wanted them to protect me from the bullies. I picked out, uh, you know, just a handful. I didn't need many. Just a handful of, of older kids. They, they became my friends. And whenever the bullies were around, my protectors stopped them. It was the original protection racket. <laughs> and then I grew up a little bit. And I lost contact with some of my protectors, but in the summer of 1964, I was just heading off to college, and I heard that one of my protectors, who I knew by the name of Mickey, I knew that he had gone to Mississippi to register voters, Freedom Summer, it was called, 1964. And Mickey, I heard, along with two others who were registering voters, Mickey, whose name was Michael Schwerner, was in Mississippi, tortured by a group of white vigilantes, including the sheriff of Neshoba County, and murdered. And when I heard that Michael Schwerner, my protector, the person who was keeping the bullies away from me when I was a kid, was tortured and murdered by the real, serious, powerful bullies. I think it changed my life. It made me understand something that I had not fully understood. It made me understand that the essence of bullying has to do with power. That those who, in a society, have no power, who feel most vulnerable, who feel that they have no agency, no capacity to change what is happening to them, those people usually at the bottom or near the bottom of whatever social hierarchy and economic hierarchy exists, those people suffer. They're not literally beaten up. They're not literally, most of the time, killed or tortured. But they suffer in many, many, many ways. They suffer humiliation and powerlessness and vulnerability. And the longer and larger the hierarchy, that is, more inequality you have, the people who are near the bottom feel that degree of powerlessness and vulnerability and humiliation more than they do when there are real opportunities to get ahead, when they can see that the middle class is open to them when they feel that the system is fundamentally fair, 
when they feel that they could potentially succeed. In other words, the kind of savage inequalities that we are seeing and witnessing today in the United States and elsewhere in the world, it is not just the United States, but the United States, as I said, among rich nations, is the outlier. Is correlated with public health problems in part because those problems themselves derive from a sense of hopelessness and powerlessness and vulnerability and humiliation. The good news is that this can be reversed. The good news is that we as a society have the power to change it. The good news is that we can get together, as for example Los Angeles did recently with an enacted a $15 minimum wage over the next three years. A good, important step. In other words, the organization of the economy counts. And if there's one thing I ask you all, soon to be graduates of the Fielding School of Public Health, to remember from what I say, and by the way, you're not going to remember much. In fact, you've already forgotten a lot of what I've said to you today. <laughs> but if there's one thing I ask you to remember, it's that public health is related to the structure of the economy, the organization of the economy. And that structure and that organization are fundamentally political decisions. Therefore, your careers in public health are going to inevitably, invariably involve to some extent, and I hope they do to a larger extent, involve politics and the allocation of power. To be a change agent, you've got to have courage and you've got to be diligent and patient. To be a change agent, you've got to look power in the eye. To be a change agent, you've got to mobilize and organize and energize people out of powerlessness and humiliation and feelings of inefficacy. To be a change agent, you've got to put yourself on the line. I'm sure I can say, in conclusion, that I represent the views of most, if not all, of your faculty when I say that we do what we do because we believe in you. We believe that you will make a difference. That's why we do what we do. So members of the great Fielding School of Public Health class of 2015, go forth, change the world, and have a good life while you do it. Thank you.